Hey y'all, welcome back to Made It To Medicine with Vix. I'm Vicky, but you can call me Vix. And today we're going to talk about my feelings when I found out that I had to sit for the MCAT for the fifth time. Yes, I know I've mentioned this several times, but I never truly have spoken on how I felt that day. So come on, let's go and let's talk about it. And let's talk about it now. I had, well, the first time I sat for the MCAT, I had no business sitting for it. I was trying to rush the fact that I did not want to deal with the unknown, what was uncertain, just this aloof world that no one knew anything about. There was no data, no anything, no analysis on what the 2015 MCAT would look like. So although I was ill-prepared, I still sat for the MCAT in January of 2015 my practice tests were telling me that I was going to score in the third percentile. But what did I do? I took the test anyway. You know, my mother, she's a praying woman. And she said, you know, Vicky, I think you should still take the test and just pray about it. Like maybe God will lead you to the right answers. Yeah, that ain't happening. I'm not saying that I don't believe that God can, like, you know, he not a miracle worker. He can do wondrous things. He can move mountains. He can part the Red Sea. But faith without works is dead. And yes, I had faith that I could do well, that I would perform at my best, to the best of my abilities. But I was not putting in the work to reap the results that I felt I deserved. So I sat for that MCAT and I got a 13. Yeah, that was devastating. I was so happy, you know, like, sat for the MCAT, y'all. I'm never, you know, at that point, actually, let me not lie. I didn't even say I'm never gonna have to take it again. Cause that wasn't a thought, right? But I knew I didn't do well because I waited a month after my score released to check my score. Any pre-med student that you talk to, the day it says that score is gonna be released, you have anxiety, it's fear, it's tension because you don't know the digits that you're going to see on that screen. What did I do though? I took my time, I lived my best life, I continued working at that time as a medical scribe. And one day I was like, oh, let me check this score. I think it's up there. Yeah, I had saw that 13. I was like, okay, let me enroll in this course that my school is offering to its students. I enrolled in the course. I still, I just wasn't ready because my scientific foundation, my background, it wasn't there. So the second time and the third time I took the MCAT, I enrolled in a self-paced course on my own. And again, I just lacked the knowledge to perform well. So let's fast forward, you know, to last year when I sat for the MCAT for the fifth time. When I took it the fourth time, I said this would be the last time that I sat for this test. And I thought I meant that like, I got a 493, no, that's not amazing, but it's not the fifth percentile, it's the 25th percentile. So I was a little bit indifferent when I got my score back, like, yeah, I improved by 10 points, but did I improve enough to where school would want me? But they could, they look past my fault of the MCAT and see me for the diligent, intelligent, um, I don't know, enter any adjective you could think of, you know, like dedicated, um, persevered, resilient, could they see me as that person? Could they see that VIX? Or are they going to lock in on this MCAT score and judge me for that? I obtained some interviews, but I did not prep for the interviews. So I won't even blame not being accepted on my MCAT. I went in there and I just prepped by myself because I felt too embarrassed, too, I didn't want to be vulnerable. That was too raw of an emotion or encounter to work with someone to, for interview prepping, not knowing that I hurt myself when I didn't want to be vulnerable with someone else. Instead, I was saying I can't be vulnerable with myself. I can't trust that the words that I'm saying are equipped enough for someone else to hear them and give me constructive feedback. I played myself. I shot myself in the foot. So last year, I was enrolled in a medical neuroscience course. And as all of you know, we hit a global pandemic. In the state of Illinois on March 17th, I believe, we were 
declared into a stay-at-home order. My classes shifted from in-person to online as many of yours did as well. I did not fare well with that switch. I'm gonna be honest with you. Like, I'm not the student that goes to class. I watch the recordings, but I keep up every day and I study at least 12 hours daily. And when we switched from in-person to virtual, it was just different. Like, now I felt compelled to go to class because I can't just go to office hours. There are group office hours on Zoom and like, I barely know these people. How am I supposed to interact with the students and the professor at the same time? It was just a little chaotic for me personally. And then experiencing loss in my family from the pandemic or family members getting sick and as a result to the pandemic, mentally, I was not in the right space to continue my program. So I made the difficult decision to withdraw from my medical neuroscience class. By me doing that, the program was saying like, I don't know, we might let you come back and sit through us our program again, but we have now changed our MCAT requirement from a 490 for matriculation to the medical school to a 495. I had a 493. I cried. <laughs> like, I can't even lie to you. I cried so hard and I called a friend on the phone and I cried some more because at this point, what is vulnerability? Who cares anymore? I felt like my world was over. And that moment I think is very important to feel whatever, feel what you're feeling, whether it's anger, um, being upset, sad, frustration, anxiety, depression, whatever it is, allow yourself the opportunity to feel. Like, I can't remember who I saw said this, they let themselves feel it for 24 hours. And after that 24 hours, you make a plan, you execute, we see what we're gonna do next, how are we going to move forward? So that's what I did. I was sad as crap, okay? I was very sad. And for 24 hours, I just laid in the bed and I cried. I texted my mother and told her what was going on. She called me, I didn't answer. Had Bible study that night, I didn't go. It was virtual, of course, but I didn't go because I just didn't want to be bothered with anyone. I wanted to sit in my own crap and deal with it. But after I dug myself up, I was tired of crying. I was tired of my, under my nose being all red from all the tissue from blowing my nose all day. I made a plan. I called my advisor, asked him, did he feel that I would be prepared enough to sit for the MCAT to apply for the 2021 cycle? He said yes, and of course we had a very long conversation about it. And I set out a study schedule to study for the next three months to sit for the MCAT at the end of August. Well, at the time it was mid-August. And when I was at the end of studying or nearing my test date three weeks out, I reached out for a tutor because something just wasn't clicking. I wasn't scoring consistently over 496. And I knew that with this being a multi-repeat test taker, I needed to show significant improvement. My tutor told me to take the next two days off to refresh, recuperate, rejuvenate my mind so that I could just jump in, hit the ground running and get these new test taking strategies and all these skills, these analysis tools, everything to equip me so that I could perform my best when I sat for the exam. And then she told me that she thought I need to push my exam back an extra two weeks. I was definitely upset about that because I had to redo my program, right? So I'm thinking if I take the test on April, excuse me, on August 15th, I'll have five weeks of vacation before classes begin. She basically told me, no, that wasn't gonna work. Do you want to sit for this test, perform poorly and have to sit for this test again? Or do you wanna do things the right way and be done with it forever? <laughs> I wanna be done forever. I wanted to be done forever four times ago. But yes, we were going to choose the right thing this time and not rush the process, but to trust the process. So we met twice a week, the very, um, the week of my MCAT, of course, you get those nervous jitters and I was sad or, I don't know, I just felt a little uneasy. Took a mock exam five days before my test and I got a 496 and I said, all right, I've done all of this. I've worked this hard, I've worked too hard, I've given too much and what do I have to show for it? What am I gaining 
from studying my behind off of 12 to 15 hour days, not going home to see family or friends. It's a pandemic, so I can't even meet up with people and anything I do is on Zoom or the only person, people interaction that I have is when I go to the grocery store with strangers and I can only see half of their faces. Is this how I'm really gonna go out? My friend told me, maybe you're just burned out. I think you've been studying so hard that you know what it is that you need to do, but your brain is just like mushed and so it, it just can't, it's not comprehending what's going on. I did light flashcards for the rest of the week. The day of the exam, I woke up, felt energized at four o'clock in the morning when I woke up for that 6 a.m. test to drive an hour away. I felt good though. I felt real good when I left the, the testing site. I said, okay. God, if this is your will, let it be done. That was my prayer for that final month leading up to my test. God, if this is your will, let it be done. I don't want to fight you anymore. I don't want to do things my way. I want to do it your way. I want to put all of my trust, all of my faith in you. And I want you, you know, if, if I get a good score, we're going to apply. Like we're going to continue to apply. And if I don't, reveal a new calling for me. Of course, I was not willing to give up, but I was ready to surrender. And I think that that's the, a key important message here is that like, just surrender it all and do what you can do, control what you can control and whatever you can't control, give it to God. Seriously, I mean, I'm a believer and so that's what I did, but you give it to whatever force, whatever universe or whatever energy spirit that you bring in don't stress yourself out though, because stress is a silent killer and I swear I was silently dying inside. So I, I did what needed to be done and I got my score back 16 days later and I screamed, I cried, I looked at the screen again and refreshed it to make sure my eyes were seeing what it was seeing. I got a 501 on the test. I'm not about to discredit my accomplishment. Your goals are your goals, my goals are my goals. I went to break 500 and I did that. It took me five times, but I did it. It took me, shoot, five years, <laughs> but I did it. Maybe five might be my new favorite number. I don't really know, but these were my feelings. I know a lot of people will tell you that it's not easy, went through a lot of trials and tribulations, but I want to, to take you through the trials and the tribulations the highs and the lows to know that in the end, like just keep the faith and keep pushing, keep working towards your goals and you'll be exactly where you're supposed to be. Um, so, I mean, yeah, thanks y'all. If you have any questions or anything, comment down below. I definitely read them and I'll reach back out to you, but thank you so much for tuning into this episode of made it to medicine with Vix. When I talked and I discussed how I felt, when I had to sit for the MCAT for the fifth time. Until next time, y'all. See ya.